So without further ado, please welcome Alex Lewis. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm going to take you all the way back to 2013. Now, at that point, I was a stay-at-home father to my little son, who was two at the time. Uh, my partner and I, Lucy, we had uh, one pub in a little village just outside of Winchester, and we had a restaurant in uh, my hometown of Stockbridge, which was also just outside of Winchester. Now. My responsibility was to not, not only look after my son, but also to look after the pub in the countryside. But I was the laziest father, landlord, businessman that you could ever imagine. Um, I had no drive, no get up and go. I was horizontal all the time. It drove my partner Lucy nuts. It was one of the worst that she hated it about me, hated it. And I guess at that point, there was nothing that really really got me excited and unfortunately living above a pub it was too easy for me to start to drink heavily now despite being in charge of my son i'd be drinking maybe 10 16 pints a day and after about a year that turned into 20 pints a day three bottles of wine four bottles of wine at night it was out of control and all of a sudden in november 2013 it was mid-november and I caught what I thought was just a common case of man flu. Obviously, all the men in the room will attest that man flu is really, really bad. Probably the worst kind of flu you'll ever get. And I moaned constantly. I moaned for the first 10 days. And after about 10 days, I started to get really, really bad sweats, hot and cold sweats. And I had no control over it. And I became very lethargic. After about two weeks, I went to bed one night and I woke midway through the night and I went to the loo and there was blood in my urine. I went back to bed and I said to Lucy, I said, darling, there's something seriously wrong here. You know, this isn't right. She said, look, just go to bed and wake, wake in the morning. If you still feel really bad, then we'll call the doctor and we'll get you in. So I woke in the morning and Lucy had gone to work at our other site and my son was staying with my parents and my skin was turning purple. I couldn't speak. I couldn't operate my arms. I could barely move my legs. I was semi-conscious at best. I tried to put my clothes on. I couldn't do it. There was a knock on the back door, and I managed to stagger downstairs, and I managed to open the back door, and there was Lucy and my stepfather looking at me, and they could see that something was drastically wrong. So the paramedics were called, and when they arrived to our pub, they said, look, we need to get him in the ambulance, and we must take him to intensive care straight away. So in the ambulance, they were told, Lucy was told that he's slipping out of consciousness. We need to cut 10 minutes off the journey time. Otherwise, we don't think he's going to make it. Luckily for me, I arrived at the right time, and I was burst through the doors at intensive care. And I remember all these very handsome, good-looking people in blue scrubs asking me questions about where have you been, what have you been up to. And one of the questions was, have you been uh, near any water courses? And I thought, that's a, that's a bit of a strange question. And I said, well, uh, I have, yeah. Um, at the back of one of our restaurants was a river, and on the back of the pub was a storm drain. And when I was explaining this, they said, we think you might have Vars disease. I had no idea what that was at the time. And 10 minutes later, uh, an intensivist came walking through the doors, and he took one look at me, and he said, this man's got strep A. With that, I was placed on life support. Now, obviously, I don't recall any of that. I've just been told the story many times by Lucy. Um, after the first day, the intensive care, uh, the intensivist, sorry, and the doctors and nurses said, look, to Lucy, my mum, they said, look, he's probably got a 3% chance of survival. There's a huge likelihood that in between 24 hours and 36 hours, if he hasn't rallied in that time, we will wake him and then you can say your final goodbyes. Now, I cannot imagine, as a parent myself, what that must have been like for my mother to even contemplate saying goodbye to her son, what it must have been like for my partner Lucy 
to see the man that she'd fallen in love with one minute have a cold and the next minute he's in this condition. Luckily for me, uh, one of the intensivists there heard of a therapy that they tried in the US. Now he's never, he's never ever told me what he did, but it got me back to life. And after two and a half days, I woke from my coma to be told that I had strep A. I was lying there looking at the ceiling thinking, I've no idea what that means either. And they said, well, from now on, we're going to treat you for the next six or seven days. Um, you're very lucky to be alive, but we're not going to continue your care here. You will go on to Salisbury Hospital. Now, when I went to Salisbury Hospital, I assumed that would be the beginning of my rehab for me to get well, to get better, maybe two or three weeks of lying down, watching bad TV, and then going home. When I arrived in Salisbury, I remember lying there, and this beautiful woman came wafting past me and she stood at the end of my bed and she said, um, how are you? I said, well, I'm very well, thank you, how are you? And she said, well, that's very polite, I'm incredibly well. I said, have you had a good day? And she went, yes, I have, thank you very much for asking. In her next breath, she said to me, you will almost certainly lose your feet. We're going to have to amputate your left arm above the elbow as the strep A is trying to get to your heart to kill you. We will try and save your right arm, but it's an incredibly risky operation. It's never been tried before. And we will have to do something about your nose and your mouth. And then she was gone. And I'm lying there thinking, that, did, that didn't happen, did it? Did she honestly just say all that? And after a, while, after a few minutes, and it felt like a lifetime, I started to lose the plot. And what was happening was me having a reaction to the, uh, all the morphine and the drugs that I was on. But I was desperate to escape. And I felt like I was doing my best to pull out the wires. I was trying to get out of bed, trying to get to my feet to walk off. The reality was that the strep had gone to toxic shock syndrome and that had led to necrotizing fasciitis and then that subsequently arrived at sepsis. So my legs were black up to my waist. My left arm was black up to my shoulder. My right arm was black up to just above the elbow and my nose and all my face and all the skin had started to die. I remember my best friend coming in and he could see that I was clearly not, not right and he said, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I said, well, I've just been told I'm going to lose my limbs. And he went nuts. He went absolutely ballistic. And then I remember Lucy and my mum coming in and I could see tears in their eyes so I knew it was going to happen. But it took me some time to just get it in my head that I needed to have my legs amputated, I needed to have my arm amputated. After about two days, they, it got to the stage where I was due in for my first surgery, and that would be to have my uh, left arm amputated. And I remember lying in bed, and a psychologist came to see me, and she goes, well, you've heard the news about your, about your arm. I said, yep. Yeah. I said, I totally get it. I thought about it. I understand that you need to amputate to save my life. I said, from now on, if I just think like that, I'll be more than happy to let the surgeons go ahead and start their work. So with that, the left arm came off. Unfortunately, as you can see, I didn't lose my, just my feet. I lost both legs above the knee. Um, in the course of six months, I saw the National Health Service at its very, very best. The acute care was on the money. And the woman that had wafted in, looking so beautiful, uh, telling me that I was going to lose my limbs, we forged a relationship. I spent, in the first seven months of me being in Salisbury, 100 hours in that lady's company. Not that I knew it, because I was asleep for the entire 100 hours, but she was responsible for trying to put me back together again. And what transpired was a series of operations. My arm came off, then the legs came off, and then they would move all of the skin on my back onto my stumps. I had 36 donor sites. I required 36 skin grafts. That's all my body had left. Uh, my left shoulder was fused into my right arm. This isn't my right arm, this is my left shoulder in action. It had never been done before, never been trialled. They had no idea whether it was going to work. And the face that you see before you, this is my right shoulder, which they took and they fused it into my artery in my neck. My entire body has been moved around to give me the best chance of a life moving forward. But also while I was in there for that seven months, the acute care was brilliant and the, the intensivists and the plastic surgery team, they were wonderful. 
but the healthcare assistants, the nurses, some of those healthcare assistants were just unbelievable. They were like a, a therapy team to me. Every time I'd see them come in, they would bring a slice of the outside world into my hospital bedroom. I was in a, a, a private room. I had lots and lots of infections, and obviously I was at risk a lot of the time. So it would be important for me to engage with them, to hear about their boyfriends that were misbehaving, to hear about their favourite soap opera, to know that their cat came back having been away for 36 hours. Little snippets of their life kind of kept me sane while I was in that room. And after a while, with the, the facial surgery, um, they put a temporary flap on initially, and that meant that the, the mouth opening that I had was the size of a 5p coin. Now, it would take a healthcare assistant an hour and a half to feed me half a sandwich. So I was supported with nutrients and yogurts and all sorts of things put into me intravenously. But every healthcare assistant knew that on a Saturday night at 7 o'clock, they would be queuing up outside my room because they would get to feed me the sandwich for an hour and a half and have a viable excuse to watch X Factor on the TV. <laughs> so to me, I was their favourite patient. I was the patient that they wanted to be working on on a Saturday night. And it was just the most incredible time. And Lucy was surviving outside, but I had a little boy, and he was just under three when I fell ill. And the two and a half years that I had with him prior to falling ill was the best job that I'd ever had. It was he and I all the time. We were inseparable for two and a half years. And having gone into hospital and into the intensive care, when I came out, and he, he finally came to see me in Christmas of 2013, and I remember him coming through the double doors, and he looked, and he, he didn't recoil in horror, but it was, what on earth is that? Who, who is that man in that hospital bed? And Lucy would have to coax him to come up to the bed to get him to sit by me, for me to be able to talk to him, to say, oh, look, it's still, I'm still your dad. But these were just empty words. He could not get past the visual difference in his father. He was mortified. And I totally got it. You know, I was not in a good way. I, at that point, I was probably four and a half to four and three quarter stone in weight. I was unrecognisable. I was not the dad that he last saw with a little bit of man flu in a pub just outside of Winchester. And it took a long time for he and I to reconnect. But it was one moment in that seven months in hospital where we did reconnect. And after about six months, I remember he coming into my room and I think it was a Easter weekend and he got onto the bed and he'd watched a healthcare assistant feeding me Watsits, a very laborious task and it was about the only, only crisp snack that I could get in my mouth opening. And he witnessed this healthcare assistant do that and then he took the bag of Watsits from her and then he fed me. And that was the first time that I'd reconnected with my son after five or six months. It was the most joyous occasion for me. For him, he was just doing something that someone else was doing. But it was so important that we could reconnect and that I could start to begin uh, some way of getting back to being the father that I wanted to be. When I left hospital, I was absolutely petrified. I had no prosthesis. I had no way of going to the loo on my own. I couldn't put my clothes on. I couldn't do anything. I could not do a single thing. And we were just about to go home, and my best friend, he was based in Courcheval as a, a ski guide. And he and I have been mates since we were 10 years of age. And he would fly in every two weeks to see me, and I could not keep him away. Even if I said, look, I'm going to be out of it for the next four to six weeks, you know, you don't have to fly over. He said, no, I'm going to come and see you every two weeks. That is the deal. I will be by your bedside every two weeks. And he stuck to that. Now, when it was time for me to go home, I remember him flying in, and he came in, and, and he, he said, you look, you look worried. I said, I am, mate. I'm petrified. I, I don't want to... I don't know how I'm going to um, cope with going, going home. You know, how am I going to go to the loo? What's it going to be like for Lucy? What's it going to be like for my son? You know, what can I do for him? And he said, you don't have to worry about any of that. And I said, but I do. I'm his father. I'm Lucy's partner. I need to worry about it. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I've given up my job in Courcheval, and I'm going to move in with you for the next six months, and you and I are going to figure this out together. Now, many of you sit, sat in this room and sat with your best mates. 
And many of you in this school have got your best friends and you've been friends for years and years and years. Just imagine being on the, to be able to receive that from your best friend. I could not tell him that I didn't want it because I wanted it more than anything. I could not tell him that I didn't need him because I did need him. But I, I just couldn't, I couldn't say it. I couldn't, I couldn't get the words out. But he was adamant that he would spend the next six months with me. And that's a friendship born from 10 years of age all the way through playing county golf together, to drinking together, to living with each other, to falling out with each other, doing all the things that best mates should do. And he was the archetypal lifesaver. The nurses, the doctors, the intensivists, the anaesthetists, all the people, the hundreds and hundreds of people that had worked on me in hospital that saved my life, well, he was the next stage of that. He was the man that was going to get me to reintegrate with my family at home. And I certainly would not be sat here in front of you now speaking without that guy. Chris Bagley is his name, and he is an absolute legend in my eyes. When we got home, it was great. You know, the food improved drastically, because <laughs> hospital food is shocking. Um, and it was nice to spend time with my son, uh, to see him start his new school, to do all the normal things that dad should do. And after a while, we started to get recognised. Chris and I made this pact that I would not shy away from what happened to me. I was not willing to go home and not be seen in public. They put nearly seven figures of finance into keeping me alive and to getting me to that point. So I was not going to sit at home and pretend it hadn't happened. So we would go out to shopping centres and we would talk to the local newspapers and all of a sudden words started getting out. And then one day, out of the blue, we got this phone call from um, ITV, and it was from the team at This Morning. And they said, uh, we would love for you to come on This Morning to meet Holly and Phil. Philip Schofield, not so fussed about meeting him, but Holly Willoughby. <laughs> now, Holly Willoughby, in my eyes, is an absolute goddess. So much so that my golden Labrador, who is now 10 years of age, on her pet passport, her name is Holly Willoughby Lewis. <laughs> so to get this phone call out of the blue was just immense. And my best mate, Chris, he fancied her as well, so it was a win-win for him. And they said, we'd like you to come up to London and you'll get to meet Holly and Phil. And then afterwards, you can go into town. You'll have a great day out. So Chris and I drove up the following day and we arrived at the studios. We met Holly. Phil was there. And we, <laughs> we got onto TV and we had a great chat and it was just great. And they were really supportive. And they said, look, we know you're a huge fan of Japanese food, so we're going to pay for you to go and have dinner at Nobu in London. I said, that's incredibly kind. Um, and they said, look, you've got a car for the day, so you can go anywhere you like in town. Feel free to use it. And dinner's on us. I said, that's really kind of you. I did tell Holly the story about my dog and the pet passport. I'm not too sure how she took that. <laughs> but, you know, my dog's named after her. But this was 10.30 in the morning. Now, we had until 7.30 that night before we had to go to dinner. Now, obviously, being two guys that had spent a lot of time drinking with each other, this was the first time that we'd been out properly in months and months and months. So we said to each other, I tell you what, let's go to Soho, we'll have a glass of champagne, celebrate me in Hollywood. So we went to Soho, we had a glass of champagne, we had another glass of champagne, then we had a bottle of wine, and then we went for a six-hour lunch we didn't get to Nobu until 7.30 that night. We were absolutely steaming drunk. So much so that I can barely remember getting there. And we had a great dinner, I think. And at the end of the meal, it was half past 10, and Chris and I looked at each other, and I said to Chris, I said, at no point did we tell Lucy what we're doing today. And he's like, do you know what? I didn't even think of that. I said, well, you're going to have to ring her. I can't. So he, he shuffled up to the counter in Nobu and he rang Lucy and as you can imagine, she was absolutely livid. And obviously Chris was steaming drunk so he couldn't drive the car home. So Lucy had to send two taxis to retrieve us, one to drive Chris's car home and one to get Chris and I home. Now that was a £400 taxi ride. And I remember driving past Stop Stockbridge High Street and seeing the Greyhound, our restaurant, where well, they still had lights on. This was three in the morning. So I said, let's just, we'll have one more drink before we go home. <laughs> and then, then we'll go home and face the music. So we had one more glass of champagne, then we had another glass of champagne. And then we got home about quarter to five in the morning. And I remember 
I remember getting in the driveway and I seeing this figure in the doorway casting this long shadow down to the car. Then Chris fell out the back of the taxi at this point. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, this is going to be murder. And then um, I wheeled up to the back door and Lucy said, get to bed. I said, right. So I wheeled through, I went to bed. The following morning, I woke up at half past seven and I had a, a, a strap that was protecting the one hand that the, the surgeries had saved at that point. So putting my left shoulder into my right arm meant that they could try and save my right hand. The right hand was deemed necessary for a living and independent life. And they said, you've got to look after it, don't do too much with it. And this was about probably eight or nine months after the procedure. And we were really close to getting nerve growth back in the thumb. And if that hand had worked, that would have been unbelievable headline news for the surgery and for the team in Salisbury. When I woke that day, I tried to push myself up out of bed and I wasn't moving. And I picked up my arm and I'd snapped my arm clean in half. My right hand was dangling down by my elbow. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I did not do that inebriated in London. I knew that happened in bed that night. I was rushed back into Salisbury Hospital and I was met by my plastic surgery team and a lot of the junior doctors that had worked on me for so many hours, there were tears in their eyes. And the minute I saw that, I knew that we were in real trouble. And my plastic surgeon took a load of x-rays and it was put in the cast. And after about six hours, I was waiting in the, in the waiting room of the plastics unit. Chris, my best mate, was asleep with a hangover. And I was sort of, I was awake, but I wasn't, I didn't feel very well. And I remember she walked in and she knelt in front of me and she started to cry. And I knew then, I said, look, what, what are we looking at? And she said, well, we can try and save it. We could pin it, we could put rods in it, but it would mean that any rehab that you're looking to do this year or next year is gone. You will have to have that arm in those pins and those rods for probably two and a half years, but there's no guarantee it will work or we can amputate. Without even drawing breath, I said, let's amputate. I'm not going to spend the next two and a half years of my life hoping that something may happen when I know that there are prosthetics out there that I could use, that I could learn to use, learn to eat, learn to drink, learn to put my clothes on, all these things. I was not willing to put my life on hold. The arm was amputated and that year I did go to rehab in London. And rehab was, in my mind, it was a very a pro, I was very, I was very pro rehab. I was, all, I was excited to go there. I wanted to learn how to walk. I wanted to learn how to use prosthesis. I wanted to learn how to eat independently, to do lots and lots of tasks. So I was reliant on carers, reliant on Lucy, my partner, Sometimes even my son would help out. I didn't want that for him. I wanted to be an independent father. But when I got there, it was a very, very depressive state. So much so that people would come to visit me and we'd be laughing and joking in the corner. But we'd have to sort of hide our giggles. We felt guilty that we were having a good time in the unit. And after about six or seven weeks of being there, I went home and I knew that I had another three or four times to go back into it to be able to use the prosthesis that I needed to. And I just wasn't looking forward to it. And I thought, that rehab should not be like that. You know, we're all there in that rehab unit to learn how to do things independently, to go on to improve our life. I just could not get it in my head. The second time I went back, they said, look, you've done really well on your little stubbies, which I wore at that time, so I could potter about, but I couldn't put them on independently. So they weren't really that much use to me. They said, look, we're going to try and get you onto a knee joint and you'll be able to take off these legs independently and you'll be able to walk for further distances. But they said, we've never actually trialled it on someone as severe as you as a quadruple amputee. The likelihood of it working is minimal, but we think, you know, you are very keen to learn. We've seen you in the last six or eight weeks in rehab. We know you want to do it. You know, that, that is very, very clear to us. You want to achieve this, so we'll give it a go. So six weeks passed and these legs just weren't working. At that point I had arms, I knew roughly how to work them, but not very well. And after about six weeks I said, right, we're getting to the stage now where we need to order you a pair of legs. And I said, but these legs aren't working, why are you going to order me something that I can't actually use? And they said, well, we have to fulfill our, uh, our prescription. 
And I said, yeah, but I'm not going to use them. I said, that's mad. You, you know, I, I don't want those. It's a waste of money. And they said, no, no, you've got to have them. I said, no, 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 you're not hearing me. I, I, I don't want them. I said, how much are these legs? And they said, well, well they're between 35 and 45,000 pounds. I said, so let me get this straight. You're willing to order these legs at that huge expense, knowing that when I go home to my farm in Hampshire, I'm not going to be able to use them outside the house and that I will put those legs in a cupboard and forget about them. And they said, I'm sorry, but that's the only thing we can do. The only way you can stop that from happening is to sign out of the rehab unit and never come back. And that's exactly what I did. I wheeled out, I signed my name, and I never returned. When I came out, my best mate Chris was there, and, I, and he just said, that is just nuts. I said, that's it now. From now on, we find an alternative route. We have to, we have to see what's out there. And it led to this voyage of discovery for Chris and I. And then when Chris went back to work, it was all about finding prosthesis, prosthesis that were going to work and how much these, these were going to cost. And it took us to America where we, we went to a hangar clinic with Ben Parkinson. And we were there, Ben and I, and we would see all these Americans getting really, really excited about wearing prosthesis. And it was a really like, happy time. It was really proactive. And we loved it in there. And in America, they give you a life quote. So they sat me down and they said, right, we've figured out what you need in your life. And I thought, oh, this is going to be expensive, isn't it? And they said, well, you're looking between three and four million dollars. And I, I shook my head. I said, between three and four million dollars? And they went, yeah, you would have to raise that privately to give you a chance of living independently with the right legs and the right arms, with the right adaptions, the right equipment. I got on the plane back from the States and Lucy was with me and I said, that is just ridiculous. How on earth are we going to raise that money? But because of our connections with hospitality and we still had one restaurant, we lost the pub, unfortunately, the business went under. But the one restaurant that we had, lots and lots of people got wind of what we were doing. And all these articles are going out in the press and in TV. And at that point, we were being filmed by a documentary maker called Leo who was the most handsome, stunning Brazilian man you'll ever did see. And women would follow me around. And I'm thinking, this is great, women are following me. But they weren't, they were following Leo. And it led to all these sorts of different avenues and routes. And people would leave huge tips, 500 pound tips after their meal. And they would do Spartan races. They would do Tough Mudders. They would do skydiving. They would do anything they could because they knew that I needed so much help, so much financial help to give me just a semblance of living an independent life. And that independent life was critical to my relationship with my son. After a while, the money would start to come in and we met with a guy called uh, Mike. Now, um, Ben Parkinson is the ambassador for a charity called the Pilgrim Bandits. And Mike was the guy that set the charity up. And he said, look, you've been away with Parky and you know what he's like. I said, yeah, we had a great time, five days in America, wonderful. He said, well, we think it'd be a good fit for the charity. I said, okay, what do I have to do? And he said, well, in a few weeks' time, there's going to be a skydive. Do you fancy doing a skydive? And I said, how on earth is that going to work? I've got no legs and arms. He said, honestly, you'll be fine. <laughs> I thought, uh, not so sure about that, Mike. And um, a few weeks down the line, the day came around and the skydive was to take place. And I remember going into the uh, Netherhaven and meeting this really big burly guy. And he said, I'm going to be strapped to your back. And I said, yeah, but how's it going to work? I said, obviously, you've done a quadruple amputee before. He went, no, we've never done that. <laughs> I said, well, so hold a minute. So how do you know it's going to work? He said, well, I think it'll be all right. We've got duct tape. <laughs> now, you laugh. That was a serious comment. That's all he had was duct tape. So. All my legs were, the, re the remainder of my empty leg was strapped around my thigh. The arms were strapped around the top of my arm and my elbow. And we got up to about 14,000 feet. I've got Ben Parkinson sat behind me. He's done it before, so he's nice and calm. And I'm, I'm thinking, when I had legs and arms, you would have not got me in that plane. Under no circumstance would I have got in that plane, ever. And to think that you would have got me in that plane and then try and push me out of it at the top, not going to happen. And as we shuffled to the entrance, the exit of the plane, and we, we went into free fall, for a minute, everything was silent, very windy, and there's a guy sort of commentating behind me about what we could see in the distance. And it was the most incredible minute 
up to that point of my life. I felt free. At that point, I didn't think I was a quadruple amputee. I just felt like a normal guy, doing something kind of, kind of strange, but nonetheless, I was just free and easy and completely irrelevant, or I couldn't care less about not having arms and legs. And when we got to the ground, Leo came rushing over the field director. He said, how was that? I said, oh my God, that's amazing. I want to do more. And Mike was there and he said, well, what should we do next? And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, how do you fancy kayaking around the southern tip of Greenland? I thought, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And I got in the car that, that night and my dad was there and he said, you've never kayaked? I said, I know, I know, but I'd never jumped out of a plane. And I thought, if I'm not going to take these opportunities now, when am I going to take them? And that's the one thing that I owe to everyone in this room, all, the ki all your kids, my goodness me, the one thing that I've learned through all of this is to accept any opportunity. Lots and lots of things that I've done, I would never have done with legs and arms. I would have thought about it too much. I would have found ways to get out of doing it. I would have found excuses to get out of doing it. But when I got to the ground after that skydive, I realised that from now on, I was going to take any opportunity that came my way. So we fly out to Greenland a few weeks later, and we done some we done some training in Devon for at least two or three hours. And all of a sudden, there's my best mate and I in a kayak, and we're kayaking past huge, huge icebergs, the size of this room. And you're looking at it thinking, this is just nuts. And we'd figured out how to kayak. Now, the level of amputation that I have, we assumed that there would be somebody in the world kayaking. But we were wrong. No one as injured as me had ever kayaked, certainly not around Greenland. So we had to figure out what prosthetics I needed. How was I going to attach to the kayak? What did I need to get me through this trip? And the Pilgrim Bandits were instrumental in making this happen. And we did lots and lots of research, but it was very, very limited to what we found. So we just had to figure it out on our own. And my best mate was there. And he, at that point, was like a glorified occupational therapist. He'd worked on me so many times. And we figured out what we needed. And we got to Greenland. Seven days, we kayaked around the southern tip. We were tracked by whales. We saw the most stunning scenery. We'd fall asleep watching the northern lights. It was the most unbelievable trip that I've ever, ever done. It was phenomenal. And that I shared that with my <coughs> best friend, the friend that gave up so much of his life. I then had the ability to take him on trips like this, to sort of thank him for what he'd done. At the end of the trip, I said to Mike, I said, that was just phenomenal. The opportunity to do it, what we've seen, just the way the camaraderie worked. And again, not having to worry about being seen sat upright in a wheelchair, holding a core in, all that sort of thing. We could just, we rolled out the kayak at night, we'd shuffle up and we'd put the tent up and we'd fall asleep under the stars. It was just phenomenal. When I got back, Chris went back to Courcheval. And I think that trip was the beginning of me thinking, right, what else aren't we doing? What are other quadruple amputees like me? Because there are not many of us, but there are a few of us out in the world. What aren't we doing? And that led us to a, a, a chance encounter with a guy. And he's a, he was a PhD student at Imperial University. Now, he was studying biomechatronics. To this day, I have no idea what that is. But he said to me, he said, have you ever fancied getting involved with the university? And I said, well, no, I, you know, it's not something I'd ever thought about, but I'd be willing to give it a go. And he said, well, you'd just be a glorified guinea pig. I said, great, let's send me in and see what we can do. And when I got there, he was working on muscle whispering technology. Now, this is technology that he was developing for the US Navy. And this would enable amputees, arm amputees, to operate bionic hands in space fixing satellites. Now this was completely off the wall stuff that I never even knew existed, let alone what was being actually made and worked in London. And we got involved in the project. And then we got invited to be involved in other projects. So much so now that we do a lot of work, research work with universities on affordable prosthesis, prosthesis design, uh, all sorts of conundrums that I may face in my lifetime. I'm working with students now because no matter what happens in my life, I'm always going to be a quadruple amputee. I need to use prosthesis. But in no way am I going to accept that I've got to find four million quid in my lifetime to pay for them. That is ridiculous. 
Every day in the UK, there are 34 lower limb amputees through diabetes alone. We are growing and growing and growing in numbers. In the UK, there's about 110,000 amputees. In America, there's 5 million. And we all face the same problem. It's the cost of the prosthesis. I do not want anyone coming into or becoming an amputee and not having the right information, not knowing where to get the right prosthetics, knowing where to go. I had nothing available to me. If I'd have fallen ill in the 70s without the internet, I would have been stuffed. I'd have nothing. The only way that I've got what I've got now is through research and the internet. And I had that tool at my disposal. I figured out a way that I could use a stylus. I figured out how to use a computer, how to use an iPad to do the research and to find nothing out there. And I'm mortified. So the time that I give up now to all the universities is helping students not only develop something that I may use, but to hopefully assist numbers of untold quantity in places like Africa, places like India, South America. The numbers are huge globally. We, we don't know an actual figure. And there's no way in this world that everyone's going to be able to achieve two to four million pounds to pay for the prosthesis. Me giving up my time is vital for the research, and I'm so passionate about it that we now are involved in 10 research projects up and down the UK, from Loughborough to Southampton to Bournemouth to Imperial to universities in Lisbon to Toronto. We work globally with universities about trying to make affordable prosthesis, trying to change the way that students work with end users. In university, I was mortified to find that a student would dream up an idea, work on it for two to four years, and at the end of it, leave it in the, in the university. All the students that we work with, we pair the student with the right end user. It may be a stroke rehabilitation patient, it may be a double, amputee, a double leg amputee, it may be a single arm amputee, it may be somebody with Alzheimer's. I have a microchip embedded in my left arm. And there's been lots and lots of uh, news about microchips recently. Well, my left arm can unlock my front door. My left arm can unlock all the doors in my house. It can also store all my medical details. So when I travel, the only thing you need, if I fall ill anywhere in the world, all you need is an app on your phone and you can access all the vital medical details that I possess. Think of somebody that's allergic to penicillin and they fall ill and you don't know it. To have that information on you is absolutely life-changing. And this is just one of the projects we're involved with. I have a, a microchip in my right arm which we intend to use for contactless payment. So I don't have to worry about carrying a wallet, using a credit card. I can just wave my arm. Can you imagine how popular I'm going to be in pubs and clubs around the UK <laughs> if they just know that they can get me to wave and it pays for their round of drinks? But this is the sort of technology that we have to be passionate about. It is all about the future and we have so much at our disposal. We're very sport in the UK and I think sometimes I forget it and I think a lot of people forget it. We have the National Health Service, we have charities at our disposal, we have so much around us and available to us that we can access it but there are millions and millions of people that don't have that in this world. And for me, it's not about using the tech for trying to furnish people in the UK, it's the global market. We need to think big, way bigger than the UK, way bigger than Europe. It's all about the global market. All these travels and all the research work and everything else, to say it's altered me for the best would be an understatement. I am not the same man that I was six years ago. I'm a, I'm a far better guy because of it. If you said to me now, if you could turn the clock back six years ago and you could keep your legs and arms, would you want to? I'd say no. I would not want my legs and arms back. Not at all. The last five and a half, six years of my life has been unbelievable. Incredible. I've seen the National Health Service at its best. I've seen the love, the effort, the, the work they put into patients. It's incredible. You know, these people, it's vocational work. It's not well paid, but they give up their time and they do it. The volunteers in the hospitals, the volunteers that used to come round to my room two, three times a week, they were my therapy. They were my psychologists. All these unsung heroes that we meet, it was the, the learning curve that we've been on through the prosthesis, through the 
realizing that I like skydiving to actually enjoy traveling. Two years ago, I was kayaking uh, through Namibia on the Orange River with the Pilgrim Bandits. And as a quadruple amputee, we're hot all the time. I produce the same amount of blood. It's just got nowhere to go. So the only place I can sweat is my head. Well, the best place for me not to be is a desert on a river. <laughs> but it didn't matter. I loved it. I pushed myself through it. But the trip 18 months ago in Namibia was perhaps a step too far because I got to the point where I was just accepting anything, whether it was dangerous. It wasn't supposed to be dangerous, but when you put it in the hands of a, well, in the hooks of a quadruple amputee, a lot of things are dangerous. But I was in that kite with my best mate, and we, got, we went through six or seven days, and the, the river level had dropped by two metres. We were told it would be easy paddling for eight days, just a little meander down a nice river in Africa, they said. What it turned out to be was um, rapids everywhere. Every 10, 15 minutes we were dealing with rapids. And Chris and I were the two most inexperienced kayakers in the entire group. We were absolutely scared stiff for the first seven days. At the end of the seven days, we were the only remaining duo that had not capsized. Now, don't ask me how we managed it, but we did. <laughs> but we got to the final day, and we were about to face our worst set of rapids. And the guide said, look, don't worry, you guys have been fine. You've done really well. He said, Alex, you know, you've kite the last seven days here. You've been around the southern tip of Greenland. You know all the drills about rolling out of your kayak attached to a paddle. When he said that, I thought, I've never done a drill like that. <laughs> he, said, um, he said, what do you mean you've never done a drill like that? He said, you must have learned to roll out of your kayak and push yourself out of the kayak attached to the paddle. I said, no. And Chris looked at me and said, no, we did it down in uh, Devon with no, no arms and no paddle. That worked all right. And he said, well, that would, that's a buoyancy aid. He said, you're attached to heavy prosthesis. You're attached to a paddle. You're going to sink like a stone. And when he said that, I thought, you know what? Now you say it, that, that actually does ring true. <laughs> and I said, so, well, I said, I'm not going to get out the kayak now. I said, I, I am in this. He said, well, if you do roll, you've got to rely on Chris pushing himself out of the kayak, trying to get to you, pulling you out of the kayak, and then dragging you up above the water, and then getting you to shore. He said, that's a big ask from anybody. And Chris was like, let's do it, let's do it. You know, he's like the little <laughs> devil on my shoulder saying, yeah, yeah, we do that, we do that, it's fine. So we set off down this rapid, and there was an enormous boulder in the middle of the river. Massive, absolutely massive. It was about four metres wide. And any decent kayaker could avoid that. Not us, we hit that square on. God knows how. And we flipped upside down. And I remember tipping up, and I'm in the water, I'm attached to the paddle, and there was nothing I could do about it. Absolutely, I was helpless. And luckily for me, Chris did get himself out of the kayak. He did get me out of the kayak. And about 200 metres further on down, we got to shore, having been bumped off rocks and all sorts. As he dragged me to shore, I was tingling, and I was giggling like a schoolgirl, because I loved it. I loved every single minute of it. And he was the same. But... At the end of the trip, as we were saying goodbye to the Pilgrim Bandits, and we, we had a few days left in, in Cape Town, I spent them with Lucy and my son Sam. And it was at that point that I realised, yes, you can do these things, but you've still got a family. You've still got a partner. You've still got a son. They're relying on you coming back from these trips. And I think it... I'm still going to do some crazy stuff, but it did make me think twice. Although I was thoroughly enjoying the trip, I was perhaps too carefree about it. And I had to kind of rein myself in slightly at the end of it. And that leads me nicely on to my next trip. And the trips I've been on were great, phenomenal countries, and we were honoured to go there and to do it in such a way that we were kayaking and having a great time. But we never left anything behind. Sure, we, we spent some money over there and we paid for the trip, but there was no legacy. This is all about self-improvement, sort of personal motivation. And I wanted more than that. I think all the research work at universities have kind of changed me in a way that not only do I want to make it better for amputees, but I want to make it better for all sorts of people. And I think one of the most powerful things that we all possess in this room is the ability to make a difference. And I don't think I ever thought I had that ability prior to falling ill. 
Now I know that I can make a difference. So the next trip, we, I had a chat with a guy and he said, look, I, I want to do a bit of a boys on tour thing. I know you're good at that. I said, I'm excellent at that. But I said, that's it's great, but it, I, want, I want more than that. I'm going to leave something behind, something that that country may need. It may be something trivial or it could be, could be something huge. So we settled on the idea. Um, we worked with the University of Southampton and we created a four-wheeled, solar-assisted, battery-powered hand cycle. That's custom-built for me. It goes about 60 kilometres an hour, which when, with a man with no arms is not good. Um, it's got a reverse pedal brake, which is even worse. Hopefully we'll gloss over that. Um, but the idea was that we would take two of these vehicles to Ethiopia, and we're going to cycle them up Ethiopia's highest mountain. And initially, we were going to leave one of those hand cycles behind so anybody with a disability could use it. And we could monitor how they would use it for trade. Could it mean that somebody disabled could actually leave their community, go further afield to perhaps start a new job and be able to get to and from that work? Unfortunately, the Ethiopian government wouldn't let us leave the bike behind. So in that case, we said, right, we will bring both bikes back to the UK, but instead we raised £50,000 and we're going to set up a wheelchair manufacturing facility over there. Now, in places like Ethiopia, disability, like mine, is viewed as a curse. You're not allowed out of your home. You certainly can't integrate in the public. Very few work. There's very, very, very little for them over there. It's depressing, shocking. And that brings you back to how lucky we are in the UK. We are accepted here in the UK. There are drop curbs. There's a lot of disability access. We can go pretty much anywhere we like, as Chris and I proved that night in London. And for us, the wheelchair manufacturing facility will make affordable wheelchairs. Now, the chair that I'm sat in at the moment is £7,500. Now, I have no idea why it's that much money. I couldn't tell you. It's absolutely crazy money. It's the cost of a small car. And the average income in Ethiopia is £1,100. So anyone with a disability or mobility impaired that needs a wheelchair, they simply don't have one. So the wheelchairs we aim to produce, we've created a viable business over there, and they will produce 200 wheelchairs a year. 75% will be paid for by NGOs. The other 25% will be bought by the people that can afford them. And we will then open that out to the communities, the surrounding communities of Addis, Addis Ababa, the, the capital over there. And then we will make two more facilities over the next two years. In two years' time, we aim to make between six and 800 wheelchairs a year. Now, that can make a huge difference to their life. Incredible difference. I know what my wheelchair has given me. And to think that we can now replicate that in countries that would never have even dreamed of getting a wheelchair is just phenomenal. And for me, that's where my future lies. I have a business. I'm a, I'm a self-employed interior designer. I love doing that. But for me, it's having that ability to make some change, positive change. The factories that we make in Ethiopia, we're rolling that out to something similar in Mongolia the year after. In 2021, we go to the Arctic to produce something similar. They may, they may not need wheelchairs. They may, they may need something else adapted, but we can do it. We've proven in Ethiopia that we can make those wheelchairs cost-effective, affordable, and for anybody that needs them. There was a lovely story. I, I got a picture of a guy. He crawled into the unit about three weeks ago. He had polio. He'd lost his right leg, I think. And he had fashioned some wooden blocks to drag him into the unit because he heard about the wheelchairs. The following day, he left with a custom-built hand cycle. That's the first time he's ever sat off the ground. To that guy, his independence, his life is altered immeasurably in the future. And for me, that's where my future lies. You know, when we do Mongolia, when we do the Arctic, we're not stopping there. We're working with the University of Southampton. We're going to create the world's first solar-assisted, battery-powered, adapted pedalo. Because there were some students two years ago that pedaloed across the Atlantic. I think they were drunk when they did it. <laughs> but they pedaloed across the Atlantic from, uh, from Morocco to Antigua. And we aim to replicate that, but we're going to do it with prosthetic arms and me and my best friend. The year after that, we're going to do something with flight. Now, I have no idea how that's going to pan out, but 
It's pushing the boundaries. And I think we all have limitations. We think we have limitations. But actually, it's mental. The only limitation we have is in our mind. For me, a quadruple amputee, no legs, no arms. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love the daily challenge of it. I love the fact that I've got to think outside the box. I love the fact that every day in my life now is completely different. I'm incredibly lucky. And if I may, I'm going to play you a short clip of what the vehicle will look like when we go out to Ethiopia. Now, he's already climbed his own mountain as a quadruple amputee, but his next challenge is literally the highest point in Ethiopia. I'm sure you remember Alex Lewis. Now, he lost his arms and legs, you remember, in 2013 after he contracted a serious bacterial infection. His recovery has amazed people along with his determination to get on with his life. And now he's planning to go to the top of Ethiopia's highest mountain. He'll use a hand cycle specially made for him by Southampton University. Laura Trant was there as Alex had his first look at the machine, which will lead the Wild Wheelchair Project. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. This specially engineered hand cycle will get Alex to the top of Rash Dashen in Ethiopia. It'll be interesting to see how my prosthetics cope with it, um, how my body copes with it. <laughs> so these are my sports prosthesis that I use for my um, kayaking, cycling. This is the first time he's actually been in it. We don't know how it's going to work with him. We need to find out what sort of power up he's capable of. <laughs> the purpose of today's road testing is to make changes and tweaks to make sure this will work for Alex when he's out on the adventure in Ethiopia. <laughs> this is wicked. This is like driving a quad bike with your hands. It goes really fast. We're talking up to 50 kilometers an hour here. That means that Alex, unfortunately for him, needs an inhibitor so he doesn't go too fast when he's going downhill in Ethiopia. Alex and his co-adventurer, David yeah. Collinson, will go on their Ethiopia expedition early next year. Joining them for the 5,000 meter ride will be 19-year-old Emmabet Aleduris in another hand cycle. She was hit by a car when she was three and lost both of her legs. Alex is on a tandem mission. He's also raising £40,000 to turn a wheelchair workshop in Bahadar into a factory. In Ethiopia, there's next to nothing. And I think the fact that we can take something like this over to them and say, look, this is what we can do. Uh, also to set up the wheel wheelchair manufacturing plant there to make a lot of change, a lot of positive change over there. We're very lucky. I'm very fortunate that I get to go on these trips. Back in Hampshire, the purpose of the day is to see what needs to be tweaked. It's good, it's just the, the left arm keeps, keeps slipping off. When I got on the back on the first ride with Alex and I heard his just like sort of cheers and how happy he was, that for me was just like, okay, we've done it now. Like it's, it's real, you know, and I mean, it's unbelievable. It really is. David has explored the Ethiopian terrain and knows the challenge ahead. I'm very excited about getting to the top. Um, there's a couple of bits I know will be a real challenge, but also I'm, I'm very excited at, at, at the sort of reaction we'll see from the Ethiopians and the Ethiopian lady who's coming with us, that hopefully this will make a difference to them. After making the adjustments to the hand cycle, the next test will be on rougher ground with boulders. No obstacle to Alex. Laura Trant, BBC South Today. But one of the best things for us, I think, as a group, and I know Rosemary and I work very closely with a lot of guys on this, for me to get to the top of that mountain, we have a 60 metre vertical climb when we get to the top of the mountain. Um, we're not very good at mountaineering, as you would probably be quite obvious. So we've somehow to sort of pulley ourselves up and there's lots of people involved. But for me, to see Emma Bet, an Ethiopian, able to climb her highest mountain and to sit her on the very pinnacle of that is just phenomenal. That's what the trip, for me personally, that's what it's all about. I want to get her to the top. Then she is the face of disability in Ethiopia. It will go out on all the news outlets, it will go on national news, and all of a sudden, 
there is a double amputee on top of the mountain. It's just unbelievable. But none of this is possible without the right support network, the right team. And from meeting Chris when I was 10 years of, 10 years of age in school, to all the people that I've met in my lifetime, everyone that supported, everyone that worked with me in the National Health Service, to all the people that run my life now, to Rose, me, to Lucy, my other half, to my son, they are my team, they are my support network, and none of this is possible without them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And I'd like to open the floor up to anybody that's got any questions. Nothing is off limits. Nothing at all. Someone's got to start. Who's going to be the first? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we don't. So we've kind of figured out the, uh, the pedalo, um, but the flight, not too sure. That. But we're already wor we're working on the Arctic at the moment, so I reckon by the end of next year, we'll be working on that project to see how it's going to work. I mean, I guess huge amounts of um, solar panels, I'm hoping, and then hopefully we'll do it in somewhere really hot and sunny, not England, obviously. Um, but no, we'll, set we'll keep you posted as to when we're doing it. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, these are, this type of prosthesis, it's just a body power prosthesis. So these have been around since circa 1950, 55. Um, and all it is, is all the strapping that runs around me and runs underneath my arms. And as I push my arm forward, the cable pulls back and there's an elastic band around the end of my hook. So as I release it, the elastic band closes it. And then we have different angles that we can use. My life is all about angles. Everything that I look at, whether I'm picking up a pen, picking up a mug, a wine glass, a lot, um, all these things, you have to, you come at it from a completely different viewpoint. You know, everything that I knew, having legs and arms, went. You know, when I, when I realised I was a quadruple amputee, it was like being two years, two years of age again. I had to relearn everything, to eat, to drink, to function. It was just the most eye-opening, but exploratory time. It's incredible. Yes. What was the first thing you learned to do? I reckon that the first thing I learned to do, so my taste buds changed completely <coughs> due to the, the, the amount of anaesthetic and the morphine and all the other drugs that I was put on initially. And I remember when I came around, I used to love cheese. I was always a sour guy, never a sweet guy, prior to falling ill. And I remember probably about four or five months into it, and I, I managed to sit myself up out of bed, and I just had this craving for Haribo. All I wanted was Haribo. That was it, <laughs> nothing else, just lots of Haribo. And what I, I learned was how to, um, I couldn't open the bag at that point, so I didn't have prosthesis, but then I learned to um, move the Haribo onto my right arm for them to me to eat. And that was like, it was uh, incredible. The first time that I'd actually fed myself something tasty. Um, yeah, that was the first thing. Um, and sadly, I don't have that craving for sweets anymore. <coughs> yes. Um, my health is pretty good. Unfortunately, every 18 months, I contract strep A again. We don't know why. We were told initially that I would never, ever get it twice. Never happened, never get it twice. And unfortunately, I've had it about three or four times now. Um, luckily for me, I know the symptoms. It's always around when my son's got a cold or Lucy's got a cold. And it will manifest as the beginning of flu. And then I just have to rush myself to the doctors to get the right antibiotics. And then it's treated for up to a month at a time. Um, and as for surgery, I think I've had 128 hours, I think, in total up to now. Um, I always forget, but all, all my lips and my freckles are 3D tattooed. 
So I, I go for tattooing every 18 months or so, which is by far the most painful thing that I've gone through, I think. <laughs> I don't, don't understand anyone that goes through that. Um, but the tattooing is constant, and so is there's always procedures. A year ago, I was skateboarding my little boy outside our house, and I bought a skateboard ramp, obviously, because that's what you do as a dad. And I didn't, <laughs> I was going down this steep hill, I didn't get enough speed up, so I completely just tanked into the, into the ramp. But then my, my right arm prosthesis got caught and I snagged my arm within the socket and a lot of the scar line that were created had, had come open. So then I had to go back in for more remedial surgery for that. So there's always things that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna damage. I reckon maybe once or twice a year, I'm in to see my plastic surgeon. Um, so it's, it's constant, it's never ever gonna end. But going back to Salisbury Hospital for me is like going home. You know, every time I go in there, if it's a follow-up, uh, you know, uh, just a meeting with my surgeon, it's like seeing all your old friends and family. You know, people will stop you in the corridor as you're wheeling down it. It's just lovely. And this sounds probably very bizarre, but when I actually go into theatre and they start the countdown for me to drift off to sleep, I know that that is the best sleep I'm ever going to get. There is nothing quite like it. And when you do come round, I always look at it that every time I go in there, they're going to improve me. They're not doing it because they, that they feel they have to. They are trying to improve me, to put me back together, for me to then go on to live an amazing life. Yes? How Sorry, say that again. How, how deep, how deep, how deep, how deep so we two of the students at Imperial that we worked with, they've created a low-cost... Um, uh, lower arm prosthesis and you can pick that up for about 250 to 300 pounds and attachments that you'll be able to draw with, paint with a wine glass attachment obviously um, <laughs> things like that are all 3D printed so you're looking at an arm that can give uh, a level of independence or just if it's enough to uh, make you start a new hobby you know it all helps and you can get something like that for between four or five hundred pounds all in um, Sadly, with these arms, until 3D printing is an accepted form of prosthesis, uh, we're a long way off. Uh, all my prosthesis are carbon fiber, as it's deemed the strongest, um, which it is. You know, I, I fall out of my wheelchair. You know, I, I, I do injure myself. You know, I do uh, break things, break cables. All these things cost huge amounts of money. So it's a, it's a slow process, incredibly slow. But that's what the university work is for. It's about getting these students into a position where they take the right product to market and then it's for us to nurture them to then take on the... In the world of prosthesis, you're looking at maybe two or three big companies that control the entire global market. So that's what you're battling against. So it's, a, it's an uphill struggle. Any questions? Question? Oh, yes. Well, that's a great question. I honestly don't know. I know it's made in America, so we blame the Americans. Um, every wheelchair that you buy in the UK is custom built for you. And I think you have a series of like 200 questions that you've got to answer. And then they build the wheelchair to your spec. So it's very much tailored to your, what you need. I mean, I have a, an active seat, so I wobble around and I self-propel. Um, I mean, I said to them, do I need a foot plate? I haven't got anything to put on it but they still put a foot plate there. You know, <laughs> so there's lots, lots of things that can be um, achieved and adjusted, but yeah, 7,500 pounds, I just don't, don't get it. So the wheelchair project, you can either donate as you leave the auditorium tonight, or there is a, I think it's a Virgin, is it a Virgin money page? Rosemary at the back, ladies and gentlemen, she hates being in the limelight. There's a lady over there with a green jumper on, she's ducking her head. <laughs> now, I could not live my life without this lady. And um, she drives me to all these events, all the work with the university. Uh, she's been absolutely integral in the Ethiopian project and the next four projects we do. So without that lady, again, I wouldn't be here in front of you. Now, she's, she's going to hate me for saying that, so I'm gonna be, it's going to be a long four-hour drive home tonight. Yes? 
Sorry, say that again. Um, so I'd, I'm very fortunate. We, we knew very early on that my fitness levels were quite critical to me being a, an active prosthesis user. And the trouble with prosthesis is that once you get them cast to your residual limb, if you put on half a stone in weight, then that limb is obsolete. So it was all about the maintenance or the maintaining of my body weight and fitness level. And so I do a range of Pilates. I work out probably four times a week. I do the most incredible um, electromagnetic stimulation therapy at the moment. And you get strapped into this like, Victorian corset and then you're plugged into the mains <laughs> and you get, you get like these jolts go through your muscles. It lasts for about 20 minutes and you get this, I think like four seconds on, four seconds off. But it, it maintains your strength without bulking you up too much. Um, again, it's all very trial stage at the moment. But I believe, I mean, I've been using it now for probably four or five months. Now, if I'd had that EMS when I first reached rehab in London, I would have been fitter, uh, much quicker. I would have been stronger, much quicker. And I would have left rehab quicker, therefore saving the National Health Service money. So it's finding things like this, which really excite us because something like EMS can make a world of difference, not just to the, the amputee or the, the stroke rehab patient, but also saving the NHS money. Well, there are lots of um, trials, studies at the moment, where you can get uh, implants into nerves. So basically, it'd be a prosthetic hand, and it can actually work, and they attach it all around your heart. And there's been some, uh, certainly some tech involvement, looking at the neurons and how we can connect, operate limbs, osseointegration, where they drill a, they core drill through your femur, and they attach a titanium rod, and then the prosthesis can clip on and off your leg without using sockets. Um, again, there's some barnics there, but in reality, we're a long way off us seeing that over and over again. Um, we do research projects on barnics, and the hands are incredible. You know, the, the bionic hands that we all see in the press and in magazines and on the, on the internet, they are, they're, they're super cool. I mean, they are brilliant. But they make a whirring sound. So everywhere you go, if you, if you want to open your arm, it goes, it's the weirdest thing. So th there's lots of tweaks that need to be done. They need to be stronger. Um, 3D plastics, yes, that is one way to go, but that does not make a strong limb. If I had a 3D printed prosthesis on, on me, for instance, and I fell out of the wheelchair, I would shatter that prosthesis. So I, I think in the next, well, I have it on good authority from my plastic surgeon, that within the next 10 to 15 years, we will all be going through implant studies, um, hands that will actually merge into your arm. So it's, it's, it's imminent. Yes? For whatever reason, I didn't dip at all from falling ill. I think, if anything, my, my mother suffered with it. Um, Obviously being told that she was going to lose her son to all of a sudden the son still being there, but obviously half the man he used to be, you know, how that was going to impact on her. Um, Lucy, my other half, she's incredibly strong-willed, you know, incredibly proactive. And I think it hit her probably two years after it actually happened. But I, I never had that dip. And I think because I had the healthcare assistance, I had all the people, I talked to probably more people in hospital than I ever did in my normal life, in, even in the pub as a landlord. Um, I always talked about it day in, day out. Now I know from a, a male perspective, we're not exactly well known for voicing our emotions, our feelings, our, our fears, our concerns. But for me, it was imperative that I just, I talked as much as I could. You know, there would, I'd spend hours and hours alone in that room uh, of an evening from, you know, the lights would go out at 9.30 at night and then I wouldn't see anybody again until probably 8.30 the following morning. Now, when all you've done for most of the day is sleep, the night times are the, are the loneliest times, and you're looking up at the ceiling tiles, and you, sure, you think, why me? Why did it happen? But only very briefly, you know, and I, I think 
testament to that was when I did a talk with my plastic surgeon and she'd been pretty ice cool all the way through it, apart from that one time when I presented my broken arm. Um, but we were doing a talk in front of 400 anaesthetists and 400 intensivists in Salisbury. And she got on stage and, and she was talking about how I coped with it mentally and you know, where she sees me going and how she's really pleased at what's gone on. And she started to cry on stage. She was kind of that proud of what, was, what we were doing at that point. And that was very early on. And I remember getting up on stage and I said, look, you know, it, that, this is not a sad story. This is a triumph. You know, this is my plastic surgeon's triumph that I'm here able to talk to you guys. And I, I touched on mental health. And in the corner of the room was a psychologist that I met in intensive care very early on in Salisbury. And then one other time about six weeks after that. And she stood up halfway through my talk and she pointed at me and she went, that man is not normal. <laughs> Whatever you think, that is not normal. And I, when she said it, I thought, oh, I've never really looked at it like that. But it was, it was, I was quite proud of that. But why I got through it, we don't know. Was it meant to be? I, who knows? Who knows? But I just, I just had so much to live for. I think... Early, very early on when I came out of hospital, we had a very nice donation come from Coldplay into, the, into our trust. And I remember Lucy picking up the bank statement and saying, you've had some money in from Coldplay. I said, you've read that wrong, are you dyslexic? She went, no, no, it says Coldplay. And um, with that, we got an email from Chris Martin the following day. So now you received the funds. I think what you're doing is amazing take my hat off to you, I prayed for you. It was, a, it was the most gorgeous email. And he's, he's like a bit of a hero of mine, so I was completely overwhelmed by it. And he said, you should read Man's Search for Meaning by Frankel. And I was never a big reader, not at all. And I thought, you know, what? I've got some facial surgery coming up, so I'll buy the book and I'll, I'll read it on my iPad. And I, I'd had this surgery and it was like 21 hours under the knife and I woke up and I couldn't sleep for days afterwards, so I read the book. And he said to me, within that book will be something that really resonates with you. And I said, I hope you find it. And I was reading the book, and it got to about three quarters of the way through. And it wasn't a quote from Frankel, but another um, psychologist. He said, once you work out the why, you will endure anyhow. And at that point, I realized that my why was Lucy, Sam, my mum, Chris, my best mate. And the how was the quadruple amputation, the constant surgeries, the constant in and out hospital. I could deal with that because I was doing it and I had the love of them behind me.